Well, it was certainly a great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Leslie Kibling. Uh, she is a professor of computer science uh, at MIT. Um, she did some amazing work on, uh, in robotics, in uh, reinforcement learning, in uh, planning, uh, in machine learning. In fact, she founded the Journal um, of Machine Learning uh, about uh, what, 20 years ago at this point. Um, so um, we are all looking, uh, very much looking forward to your lecture. Leslie, welcome to uh, the Brain, Mind and Machines uh, summer course. Okay, well, thanks very much, Boris, and uh, welcome to everyone. So, okay, so what's my research goal? I come from the machines end of this world, roughly, and what I really want to do is figure out how it is that we can make intelligent robots. And I do this mostly because I'm interested in, in intelligence more than I'm interested actually in robots. But I think that trying to make a physical uh, agent who out goes out and interacts in the world is a really good test bed for understanding um, what kinds of reasoning and, and perception and control we need in order to make it an intelligent system. So, the way I think about the problem, so this is kind of a, a definitely a computer scientist way to think about the problem, um, is to think about the robot as a, as a transducer, as some kind of a system that's connected up to the world and it makes observations of the world and it takes actions that change the state of the world. And presumably it has, there's some objective, right? We want to, uh, we want to take actions that change the state of the world in, in some way that we think will be good. The reason I want to start by backing all the way up to this like very basic control theory picture is that right now there's an enormous amount of argument about how one should make robots. Should they do planning and reasoning? Should they do reinforcement learning? How should we do it? So there's a huge kind of crisis almost in the field about what the best methods are. And what I want to start out this talk by doing is actually thinking about how we can answer that question in a way that's not political or religious, but technical. So the way I want to think about this, the job of this program, so I'm going to make a robot. I'm going to put a program in the head of the robot. So let's say I'm not going to worry about hardware. I'm just going to worry about the software. And so the program that I'm going to put in the head of my robot, it has to do this job that's written in the formula up here. And what this is just shorthand for saying is that it has to represent some kind of mapping from observation and actions that it's had in the past. So a, OA star means the whole history of observations and actions that it's ever had. Based on that, it has to pick the next action. So that's not really saying much of anything at all. That's just a description of every single robot control program basically that's been written. You have to take your history of actions and observations, compute the next action. And so what we wanna do is think about First of all, what's the best, what would be the best pie to put inside the robot? How can we think about that? And then we have to think about the problem of how is it that we, in my case, as me, as an engineer, I'm gonna find that pie that I should put in my robot. So one way to think about the whole problem setup then is that, that I, as the robotics engineer, have to do for my robots the job that nature did for you. That is to say, I have to think about, I'm, I'm a robot factory, I'm gonna make these robots and the robots are gonna go out in the world. Maybe they're gonna go and work in people's kitchens or something and every kitchen's gonna be different. So there's gonna be a lot that I don't know about the world, but somehow I have to figure out the best program, one program to put in the head of all my robots so that when they go out in the world to behave, they can do a good job. So that's the way that I think about the problem that I face. And, in order to think about what would be the best program, uh, I kind of think about it this way. So I imagine that there's some distribution over possible environments that the robot could find itself in when it actually goes out into the world, right? So maybe it's gonna go to houses and the houses are all somewhat different. And once I put that program in the house, maybe it's gonna do some estimation or learning. Uh, it's gonna adapt to the circumstances it's in, my job is to find a program that does a good job of adapting in all the environments it might find itself in. So imagine that you have some kind of like probability distribution over the way, 
over the worlds that the robot could actually end up operating in, I want to find a program that's going to behave well, let's say get a lot of reward uh, in expectation on average over all the environments that it could possibly find itself in. So that's, that's I would say, a kind of a reasonable formal objective for a robot. Um, and one thing that's good about this as an objective is that um, uh, we don't have to argue about it, right? It doesn't, it, it doesn't say whether there should be learning in there or what kind of learning or should it be a genetic algorithm or should it have planning. In some sense, you could say, I just want to make the program that's going to be the best that can be on average over these environments. But the problem is now, I've written down an objective function. I've said, oh, if you could tell me a distribution over possible worlds that you'd like this program to work well in, then I know in a certain mathematical sense what the best program is. But now my problem as the engineer, as the person who is in the robot factory, right, which is again, kind of maybe analogous to the problem of, of nature, is I have to figure out what is, the, how, do I, how do I find this program that's gonna be good in all these situations? So there are a bunch of ways you could think about the problem. I mean, one would be to say, oh, I'm really lazy. I don't really want to think very much about working in the factory. It seems awfully hard. I will just make a robot that has roughly an empty head. It doesn't really know very much at all. Uh, and then it just has to interact uh, in the world and learn everything by interacting. But of course, you don't really want a robot that comes to your kitchen and begins to learn about physics, right? That would be break a lot of dishes. Another strategy, and this is like the classic engineering strategy, is that no, I'm a, like a serious engineer and I'm going to sit here and think really, really hard and I'm going to write a program and it's going to be a great program and I'm just going to put it straight in the robot's head and it's going to go off and it's going to be awesome and do everything it needs to do. And that strategy actually can work very well in certain kinds of problems. It lets the, you know, the Boston Dynamics robots do parkour. Uh, but as we try to address bigger and more complicated problems, it becomes harder and harder for engineers to just straight up write the program. Uh, we could just try to figure out how humans work because humans work pretty well in a variety of domains. Uh, and so one program, right, would be to say, well, we figure out how humans work and then that's what we do. We make robots that work like that. So first of all, that's a hard biology problem. I think it's a very important that people work on it. Um, but it's also not a general engineering methodology because, for instance, I might want robots that work in certain kinds of circumstances or problem domains that are really different from the niche that humans are well tuned for. And so, uh, I, you know, I might want to make a robot that isn't really human like in its intelligence. Um, and then it seems like what we're left with, and maybe we could just say, well, we'll somehow recapitulate evolution. Like we just search around in the space of programs and try to find ones that work well and then eventually get ones that are great for our environment. But that seems slow and complicated. So if I like enumerate my options and they all don't look very good, uh, I don't know what to do. Um, so uh, one thing to think about though is, is this last thing. So uh, the, the kind of evolution idea. So let's just pursue this a little bit more. So imagine that we want to try to find a program that works well uh, in expectation over all environments. One way to think about that is that like inside the factory, we kind of simulate a bunch of environments. We try a bunch of robot programs and we try to find one that works well in all those environments. Uh, and that's, um, a, that's like a really interesting strategy. We would have to think of a, a space of possible programs for the robot some objective function, we figure out, well, what are we trying to optimize, a distribution over problems to test. Um, in some sense, uh, this is a, a, a thing that people have thought about for a long time, right? This would be like running some kind of evolutionary algorithm or some search or simulation um, inside the factory. And it's very attractive, but I think generally speaking, hard to make work well. So, the question is, what should I do, right? So I just like, I could, maybe I could set up this whole evolutionary setup somehow. And then I could just snooze for a really long time while some very complicated program tries to figure out the best robot program to put in the head of the robot. Um, 
but I'm, I don't know, I am simultaneously, I'm too impatient for that. Uh, and so then the question is, can I somehow take pieces and parts of all these ideas, uh, some human programming, some robot learning in the wild, some kind of search or evolution offline, some inspiration from humans, can I take all those things and put them together and see if I can find a way to engineer intelligent robots? Um, so that's basically what I'm up to. Um, I'm gonna, well, no, okay, let me say something about this, right? So, so then the, the one way to view the research agenda is to say that, uh, first of all, I'd like to be inspired by what we know about humans. And in particular, I'm very interested in the Liz Spelke core knowledge type stuff because that tells me something about what evolution, in some sense, saw fit to engineer into natural intelligences. And if I understand that natural systems seem to be born with a bias or some built-in structure, uh, to think in terms of, of other agents, uh, to understand that they move through 3D space, to uh, talk about, to think about objects, as you know, clumps of matter that cohere. Um, that's a very helpful engineering bias for building a system. Um, I also know just some physics invariants about the worlds that my robot's gonna operate in. And maybe humans don't have this built in, but they explicitly, but they almost really have it built in implicitly. Um, and I also have some other constraints as an engineer who's trying to make intelligent robots, which is that humans, are the engineers, right? So if humans have to engineer a very complicated system, then it has to be the engineering process has to have some modularity to it because humans are really bad at understanding one big messy system. They're good at understanding pieces and parts that work together. So it may be that we have to take a, a modular design approach in our engineering efforts for intelligence not because the intelligence needs to have that architecture, but because we, the human engineers, need those tools for actually building a system. So all these constraints need to somehow come together into a way of building intelligent systems. Okay, actually, I would stop here for a minute just because it's a convenient spot and see if there are questions. I see some red Q&A button, so maybe someone can ask. Oh, yeah, we have a question here from Sasha Frilich. Uh, you say there's a big debate about which way to go in the quest for intelligent behavior, but is there any established formalism that isn't reinforcement learning or essentially a derivation thereof? <laughs> yeah, actually. Um, for years there has been. Uh, so a, a more typical formalization would be in terms of predictive models and planning or reasoning. Um, so Reinforcement learning, and also it depends, the, the phrase, unfortunately, the phrase reinforcement learning has, it grows and stretches to, and sometimes for many people and in many discourses, it's come to mean all of intelligent behavior, in which case I would say, well, no, it's all reinforcement learning, but that's vacuous. But um, uh, another for, other formulations involve reasoning about objects and, and their relationships and thinking about the long-term consequences of taking actions in the world and so on. So there's certainly different ways of framing and formalizing the problem, and they give you very different computational profiles and different learning strategies. Okay, good. So um, I will just tell you some story because people usually like story and it's kind of the afternoon. So, and this is related to the question about reinforcement learning probably, right? So how did I get into this whole thing? Um, when I just finished my undergraduate degree, which actually was in philosophy, weirdly enough, I went to work at a research institute while I was starting my PhD. And they had this robot nobody really knew actually very much about robotics. And it was my job as the brand new person to try to get the robot to drive down the hallway. And so what happened was uh, I programmed the robot and it would run into the wall and I would bring it back and I would fix the programming and it would run into the wall again, hopefully for a slightly different reason. And over the course of a couple of weeks, I managed to build, write a program that would use these funny sonar sensors on the robot and make it drive down the hall without crashing into the walls. And so that was good and I was happy in a way at the end of that, that I had gotten it to work, but I reflected on that a bit more. And what I decided was that 
I had learned how to navigate down the hallway using the sonar sensors. Um, and what I thought was that, and it had taken a long time and it was kind of a hassle and really the system should have been doing the learning, not me. And so my view was that I should figure out a way to get out of the loop, to build systems that could learn on their own to do stuff. And then I could just wait for them to do that and that would be better. So that, that, that was flaky. Um, then I kind of, uh, I, I sort of reinvented reinforcement learning in a, in a not very good way, really, but um, uh, it was kind of entertaining. And I, this is a slide, by the way, for those young people in the audience, you might know, but back in the day, we used to write with colored pens on pieces of clear plastic, and that's what we used to give talks. So I had this kind of pseudo reinforcement learning thing. And by 1990, I actually had this little robot called Spanky that did actual reinforcement learning during my actual defense. Uh, so it didn't learn anything too complicated, but it did do it in real time. So that was kind of fun. Um, so, okay, so I finished my PhD and I thought, okay, I know something about robot learning now, but I really wanna make robots that can do complicated things. And I couldn't figure out how to get basic reinforcement learning methods to really scale up to problems that I cared about. And so I, this is one last slide I'll show you from some talk that I gave in 1995. And I kind of complained that the ideal that you could take just a big bunch of what I like to call neural goo now, just a big bunch of generic neural network stuff and train it to be an intelligent agent all by itself, that that wasn't going to fe be feasible. And instead we needed some kind of compositional structure and that would give us more efficient learning and more robust behavior and so on. So I'm still there. Okay. So I'm still in, uh, I'm still trying to figure out, uh, how we can design an architecture that can learn efficiently. And so the research strategy that I have really adopted, I, I work closely with a colleague, Tomas Lozano Perez. Um, our strategy has been the following, which is to try to think of some very generic representation and inference mechanisms and build those in and then figure out how to learn the rest of the stuff. And we're all used to, I think by now, the idea of some representation and inference mechanisms that we would want to build in. For instance, everyone's used to the idea of convolution now in image space, right? So, uh, but if you think about it, and, and I've had people tell me who work on convolutional neural networks that they don't build any structure into their system. It's just a neural network. But of course, as soon as you build the convolutional structure into a neural network, you are taking a position on some regularities that are in the, the input signal and so on. And you're taking advantage of that so that you don't have to learn a whole fully connected network, but you just learn some convolutional kernels. So just as convolution gives us a, a great leverage when you apply it to the right part of the problem, then the intuition is, well, hopefully there, there's a few mechanisms, hopefully not like a hundred mechanisms, but maybe 10. And that if we figure out how to use those mechanisms to bias learning and to structure behavior, that we could learn robust uh, ways of behaving uh, that, that are efficient and so on. So one set of possible kind of general ideas includes convolution in space, also in time. Maybe understanding the kinematics of the system that it's connected together in joints and segments, uh, a notion of planning to move through space uh, being able to do causal reasoning, if I were to do this, what would happen? Abstracting over individual objects, various kinds of state and temporal abstraction and so on. So our view, I don't want to commit to a particular list, but is that there's a list of structural principles that are pretty generic, very broadly useful, and we should build them in. Um, so actually, is any questions here yet? No. Everything's been perfectly clear, so no questions. Okay, I'll keep going. Uh, I'll surely be able to offend some people soon. I'll work harder at that. Um, okay, so, so if we kind of accept this idea that we're gonna build in some structure, then what? And the thing that, that my colleague and I have done recently, well now, maybe not super recently, but we said, okay, in order to test out the idea that this, there's a set of mechanisms that, that would work well, what we did was we hand built the rest of the system. So we hand built some tra transition models, inference rules, ways of doing search control and so on, uh, and connected them up to these general mechanisms and made a system. Okay, and the, the 
just again to kind of give you the motivation, I really want a robot. This isn't my kitchen, by the way, just in case you were worried, not my kitchen. Um, but imagine that you had to clean this kitchen or make breakfast in it or something. Uh, it would be very hard. And imagine programming a robot to do it. That's extremely hard. And so one thing that's useful to do is to think about what makes this problem hard. Um, so one of the things that makes it hard is that like there are lots of objects, right? So the dimensionality of the space is kind of unthinkably high. It's also not exactly clear what constitutes an object here. Uh, if you were going to behave in this world, it would be a very long sequence of primitive actions that you would take in order to, let's say, clean this kitchen. Um, and also there's a, just a fundamental amount of uncertainty in this problem, right? So you don't know what's in the blue bowl or what will happen if you try to pull out a certain thing. You don't know when the people are coming home or what they want for dinner, all sorts of stuff you don't know. And so any approach that works effectively in a domain like this is gonna have to handle very large spaces, very long horizons, and really lots of uncertainty. So we have kind of a standard structural decomposition to this problem. Um, we call this belief space hierarchical planning in the now. I'll decode what that means a little bit. Um, Fundamentally, the way we think about it is that we decompose the computation that's in the robot's head now into two parts. The first part is in charge of taking the sequence, the history of actions and observations and trying to synthesize them into some representation of a belief or a probability distribution about the way the world might be. And then another module that takes that belief and decides how to behave. Um, our belief state representation is a little bit complicated. We want to be sure that we can deal with situations where we don't know in advance what all the objects are in the world. Ooh, I see a question. I want to stop and take it. Sounds good. We've got one from uh, Kwajo Isal. Uh, you talked about evolution, uh, RL, and creating robots that can really work at the same level as humans. But as we now know, the brain itself is quite complex to understand which itself has evolved over thousands of years to efficiently interact with this environment to extract maximum information to achieve optimal control of its random variables, then creating an intelligent system bypassing the evolutionary mechanism according uh, to you would involve what will it require finding those fundamental principles that govern the transformation of structures from one generation to the other, i.e. Uh, epistemy, uh, as Falk Foucault talks uh, about regarding evolution of system of, of thought, or is it just a massive engineering problem, which we can tackle with the current existing tools? Whew. Okay, that was a question. Um, so I, I, what I want to say is that I think the only way forward in a finite amount of time is some kind of combination of studying natural systems and trying to extract some general structural principles that seem to be useful and, and kind of broadly applicable. Uh, engineering of the classic kind, dividing the problem into pieces and trying to solve them as best we can, and offline learning. So I, th I sometimes talk about learning in the factory. So some kinds of machine learning methods or evolutionary search methods or something, deployed as locally and uh, parsimoniously as we can. So I'm hoping a combination of inspiration from natural systems, classic engineering, and offline learning can help us do for our robots the job that evolution did. Yeah. Great, thanks. Uh, the next one is from uh, Nate Manuel. Uh, could a robot use fast and frugal heuristics to make decisions? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So the, the whole, uh, you know, approximate reasoning, uh, a framework and the ideas from what Kahneman and Tversky and, and other people about that are critical uh, in the problems that we solve. Uh, you know, in computer science, we like to maybe joke a little bit that like, all the problems that AI people try to solve are like, oh, I don't know, they're NP hard or P space hard or even undecidable. And normally if that's true of a problem you're working on, you try to work on a different problem because you know you're never gonna find an efficient algorithm for it. But we're kind of stuck with the problem we have. And so we know for sure that we're gonna have to, to make lots and lots and lots of approximations. 
all over the place. Everything we do is like, oh, this problem is too hard. How can we approximate it? And so heuristics like that are absolutely critical. Thanks. And one more from uh, Laha Ale. Uh -huh. uh, how, how do you describe the complex observation like your kitchen for an RL agent? Okay, we're not doing RL. Can I say that again? Let me say it very loudly. We're not doing RL. Uh, um, uh, the idea, I think, that we can view the problem we're taking as, I mean, the problem that we're faced with as taking a sequences of images in, okay, fundamentally, the problem we're facing, let me say this again in a different way. The, fundamentally, the problem we're facing um, is one in which we take in a sequence of images and we generate a sequence of motor torques, let's say. That is, in fact, what we're doing. And it's also true that you could try to treat it as a reinforcement learning problem. But there's a bunch of reasons why I think that that's not the right framework. First of all, are we doing this? First of all, you have to think about, are we doing this learning in the factory? So is this learning that I'm doing instead of engineering? We, there's a role for some of that learning. Or is this learning that the robot's doing in your kitchen? If it's learning that the robot is doing in your kitchen, I think it will have to do some learning in your kitchen, but it should come to your kitchen very, very well equipped already, right? If, if I came to your kitchen, I might have to learn some things like where you keep stuff or what you like, but I would not have to relearn physics. And it had better be that if I sell you a robot for your kitchen, it doesn't have to learn physics while it's in your kitchen. So we engineers have to figure out a strategy for finding the program that goes in the robot's head and reinforcement learning in a simulator, let's say, is a conceivably a strategy for doing that, but it is so desperately inefficient that I just don't believe that that can be the whole story. I think it could be the right story for pieces and parts, and I'll talk about that a little bit more as we go, but I don't think that that's the, that's the story. So let me see if I can tell you my story. Okay, I'm gonna go forward for a little bit here. So, so, okay, so we're gonna, let, let's just look at this picture for a minute. So now I'm talking about engineering. So I am gonna build a bunch of structure into this thing. I am first of all gonna build a structure into my system that there's a part that is in charge of remembering stuff from the past and synthesizing that into some representation of what's going on in the world. And there's another part that's in charge of taking this belief and, and generating action. So now the question is, how do I represent the belief? Uh, and uh, what we've done again is kind of build a fair amount of structure in here. We assume that we don't know uh, what all the objects in the world are going to be in advance. In fact, maybe we don't know any of them. So we have an open world. As the robot observes objects, it adds them to a kind of mental, you could think of it as a little kind of a database in its head. Um, but it reasons all the time when it sees a new object, it reasons about whether that is a new whether it's just seeing some object it already knew about before or not. For each object, maybe it keeps in its head something like a distribution over what, what the type of the object is, how much it weighs, what its shape is, all that kind of thing. We also represent our uncertainty about the space that we're in. What parts of the space have we observed or not yet? And that's important. We represent also other things like what kinds of objects tend to occur near what other kinds of objects, let's say, in a kitchen so it could find something efficiently. If it opens a drawer and finds a fork, it might not keep looking in there to try to find an apple. So this is a complicated representation of what it believes in the world. Um, we do planning to pick sequences of actions. Uh, this is harder than typical planning because it involves integrating both planning in the continuous space of motions with planning at the higher level about which objects to pick up and what to do with them. And we do a very major approximation for deciding how to behave. So I said the state estimator is the thing that's what's keeping this distribution over objects and what space is occupied and so on. And now my problem is to decide based on this belief, how should I behave in the world? To do that optimally is to solve something called a partially observable Markov decision process, a POMDP that's known to be an undecidable problem in some settings. And it, when it's not undecidable, it's 
just doubly exponential. It's a terribly computationally difficult problem. So what do we do? We approximate, right? So back to the question about heuristics. Uh, I'll say something about the approximation, but we make a planner that basically pretends that things are deterministic, kind of assumes that it's gonna get the observations it expects it's gonna get. And it makes a plan, which is, which is not right. It does a plan that doesn't cover all the possible eventualities, but it makes a plan, takes the first step, executes that in the world, gets an observation, updates its belief, and then makes a plan again. So that if this first plan doesn't work out, it's okay, it tries again. And what's interesting is that from the perspective of the planner, it thinks about how the actions it takes are actually gonna change its own belief about the world. And so, for instance, it can make plans to change its own mental state. It can make a plan to, I don't know, ask, Boris, what we're going to have for dinner tonight? And Boris can tell me an answer, Blini, and then uh, we would update our belief. And now, is that right? No? That's breakfast. Yes, yeah. right. Okay, good. Um, but we, so, but I could, I can take actions explicitly because of their information gathering properties. And that lets me operate robustly in a complicated, in an uncertain world, because I can reason about doing things to get information just as well as I can reason about doing things to change the world state. Uh, another aspect, of, again, that we've designed into our system is hierarchy. And it's, a, it's, a, it's not options. It's a, it's a different framework, so I'll tell you about that. So we imagine that, say, the robot has a high-level goal. Maybe it, this goal is a goal that the human gave it, or maybe it has a very, very high-level goal, which is to just try to make its human happy or something like that. So it makes a plan at some high level of abstraction. Uh, it used to be that when I was flying places and giving this talk, I would always use the example of planning a trip. So imagine that I was planning to go to California or something like that. I might first plan at a very coarse level of abstraction, like I am going to get from my house to it, to the airport in Boston, and then I'm going to get to the airport in San Francisco, and then I'm going to get to where I'm going. So I could plan at this high level of abstraction. And this G is my final goal. Maybe it's that I'm at my hotel in San Francisco. Uh, and this is some operation I could do that would get me to the hotel in San Francisco, let's say from the San Francisco airport. So this is like a sub goal here. This might be to be at the San Francisco airport and this might be to be at the Boston airport. So I make this very abstract plan and then I'm optimistic. I am optimistic when I travel. I don't necessarily plan in detail how I'm gonna walk through the San Francisco airport when, before I get on the plane in Boston. I figure that I'm gonna figure that out when I get there. So what I do is I take this first sub goal uh, this was getting to the Boston airport, and I planned for that same sub goal again, but now I force myself to think about it in a bit more detail. So I make a more refined plan. Maybe it's that I'm going to get an Uber. And then I make an even more refined plan, which involves, I don't know, getting out my phone and something. Um, now, when I get to a primitive action, I've just colored them green here for some reason, maybe that's the thing I can actually do. So this is actually to go to get, get my phone because I'm going to get an Uber. And uh, maybe I go and get my phone, but then and I do that and I get an observation. And if everything goes well, it will have achieved this. I will be now in this set of states that's, that's like, okay, this is what I expected. But if it doesn't go well, um, I might make a new plan, right? So I might say, ah, oh, my phone, it's out of battery or the Uber has crashed, uh, app has crashed or something. And so I can't do this. So rather than, so what am I gonna do? I have to reconsider, I have to make a new plan. And what's interesting to think about is how to manage that kind of reconsideration, which is an interesting cognitive problem and philosophers and cognitive scientists have thought about it. Um, and you know, you might say, well, I can, I should just plan again from the high level goal, right? But that's kind of terrifying, right? Imagine that my high level goal is like to be a successful academic. Um, I wouldn't want to like reconsider all my career choices just because my phone was not charged. So what the structure lets us do is for instance, pop this whole plan off 
the stack, right? So think of this as a, as a kind of a mental stack of plans or intentions. If the bottom plan's not working out, I can pop that plan and say, okay, I'm still trying to get to the Boston airport and I really don't want to rethink that choice, right? You may know friends who rethink their choices too much. It doesn't really work out all that well. Maybe I don't want to rethink that choice. I just want to find a new way to get to the airport and maybe I'm going to drive instead. So this kind of hierarchical structure gives us very flexible and robust behavior. Uh, okay, there's a question and then I'll show you a video. Great, uh, we've got a few. Uh, first one's from Colm. Uh, is there an area, any area of AI in which problems are uh, tractable? I mean, an active area of research, not solved problems? No. I mean, uh, let, to, uh, partly because in the history of computer science, uh, uh, once a problem is quite clear, well formed, there's an algorithm for it, it's efficient, it usually is considered not to be AI anymore. So it's a moving target, what constitutes AI in that sense. But no, pretty much all our problems are just kind of, I think, if, if you formulate them in the classic worst case algorithmic complexity way, they're very, very difficult. If on the other hand, you somehow look at the distribution of problems that you actually have to solve, and you lower the bar in certain kinds of ways, because humans are certainly not optimal in a, in a kind of classic sense, they might be, there's a, there's a nice notion of bounded rationality, which I think is nice, which says, well, of course you can't be expected to behave optimally. You can't be expected to behave optimally because you lack information, but even given the information you have, you can't be expected to behave optimally because your computer's not that big. So then we could try to ask the question, could we make programs that are optimal subject to the computational limits that they have? And that's a well-formed question, but then it's actually, it turns out to be hard to, this is kind of the problem that I started with. It's hard to find programs that are optimal subject to computational limitations. Um, I'm going to charge ahead a little bit more, actually, even though there's a couple questions, but, and I'll stop again, because uh, I do want to get at least up to the learning stuff so that you don't think I'm just a completely old and boring person. Okay, but first I want to show you what a robot can do without any learning. Um, so what's interesting, actually, I want to stop this video. I have to give you one small, small speech before I continue. What's, what's interesting, I think, about this robot doing this stuff is that any individual thing it does, um, uh, several smart undergraduates in a couple weeks could program this robot to do. Uh, maybe, I don't know, it's not that easy, but, but, but yeah. But what's interesting, I think, and important about the thing I'm gonna show you here is that it's the same program that's controlling the robot, roughly, uh, in all these cases. And it's doing very, very general purpose reasoning. It knows about the objects in its world. It knows that there are soup cans and boxes of a certain size. So it, it has this prior knowledge, which it shouldn't, I would prefer that it didn't have to have, and we're working on backing off of that. But it's, we don't tell it ever what to do. It understands that it moves through space, that objects move through space. It understands what it means to grab something. Once it grabs something, the thing is attached to its hand and now it's moving around with the thing in its hand and it understands what it means to put it back down again. But it's reasoning about space, about objects, about moving things out of the way and so on is very general purpose. Um, oops. So uh, here we told it to put the box in that bottom part of the shelf. To do that, it reasoned that it had to move soap can. Here we told it to put the green box on the corner of the table. Green box is too big to pick up, so it has to push it. It moved the orange box out of the way. It also knows that its pushing is really unreliable. So after it pushes, it checks. It reasons about its belief and checks to be sure it was good. Here we told it to go out of the lab. It looked and saw that these chairs were in the way. It's moving, moved the first chair out of the way. The second chair, it just took with it. We didn't tell it to do that. We did, just, it just did that. Here we're asking it to put a full oil bottle on the other table. It's picking these oil bottles up to see if they're heavy. Um, this is a random other demonstration that doesn't really matter. And the next one will show you that it actually worked pretty nicely on another robot. It didn't take us very long to get it to work on a different robot with weird cinematography. Okay, but 
the thing about that is there was no learning in it whatsoever. We had to do, we, we had the lower level algorithmic substrate, that yellow layer, which we we're pretty happy about. But we also had to hand build everything else, which we we're also not so happy about. So now the question is, and this is really what we've been working on, I don't know, for 10 years now almost. The question is, how can we learn a bunch of the things that we had to hand build? How do we keep the general architectural stuff, but learn the other stuff? Um, and I think that one thing that's important to observe is that there's two really different kinds of learning. Uh, there's, I'll call these green boxes, learning about the world, right? And right now in robotics, most of the work is on learning perception, right? There's a ton of stuff in computer vision and so on, which is learning to do object detection and pose estimation and segmentation. And there's a ton of work, I would say almost all the work in robot learning right now is in low level motor control policies. How do I manipulate something in my hand and so on. And I think so somebody asked about reinforcement learning. I think reinforcement learning is really good at learning low level motor control policies. Things like bicycle riding and juggling and moving things in your hand and using a fork and all that stuff has to be closed loop. The very, the, the dimensionality of the state space that matters for that problem is not super high. The horizons are not very long, you know when you're failing. So I think reinforcement learning is awesome for, for doing this job. Um, but then we need to build higher level of abstractions. We have to, I think, learn observation and transition models at a higher level. So that's learning about how the world works. Then there's a bunch of other kind of learning, which is also super important, which here I've called learning to reason, or sometimes people call it metacognitive learning or something like that. Things like learning what to attend to, uh, learning in that hierarchy of plans, what to re when to reconsider, what things, learning search heuristics. So this is like the kind of learning that happens in Alpha Zero when it learns to play Go, right? It's not learning the model of how Go works. It absolutely knows that. What it's learning is how to think more efficiently. So these two things are both important. Um, so let me say something about one chunk of learning that we've done, and then I'll probably just uh, skip to the end. Um, so there's a story about building abstractions. I'm actually gonna skip this too. It has beautiful figures. Uh, okay, good, but sorry. Uh, okay, so let's just, just one vignette of learning. Um, so imagine we have a robot, it's pretty competent, you, and you wanna teach it a new thing, or it wants to learn a new thing. So it already knows how to pick things up and put them down, let's say, uh, but now it wants to learn stirring or pouring or pushing or throwing or something like that. Um, and we'll assume that somebody already used reinforcement learning to learn a very basic low level skill. And the question is, how can we add that skill into the general repertoire of this robot's existing ability, right? So you, you brought this robot, you're teaching it how to make a souffle. It didn't know that. It should learn how to make a souffle without too much trouble. Um, the way we think about this is in the context of actually fairly classical planning problem formulations. So we say, well, uh, pouring, let's say take pouring as an example, uh, somebody learned a motor skill for pouring and maybe it has a parameter like a gain parameter. I have to learn now a formulation. I have to learn the conditions under which if I do this pouring action, the liquid will go where it's supposed to. So what's the context in which this thing will work? And so uh, in this work, we engineered this part. In some other work, we've, we're learning it as well. But in this case, we observe that there's some set of state variables that really seems to be the, the conditions that affect whether the pouring is going to be effective. The sizes of the things we're pouring between and so on, relative poses. And so then what we try to do is learn a kind of a condition on these variables, on the sizes of the, of the vessels and on their relative poses, on the grasp that the robot has of the vessel, uh, on the, of the gain and the controller, some relationship among those variables, such that if I execute the pouring action under those circumstances, then most of the liquid will go into the target. 
Um, uh, the details of how we do that, I'm not going to go into in detail. We use Gaussian process regression. So we take a bunch of examples of pouring in a bunch of different circumstances, and we try to learn when does it work out well. And we use notions of learning that keep track of how certain we are about the hypothesis so that we can learn efficiently with relatively small amounts of data. So I'm not going to talk about that. I'm just going to show you a movie because it's fun. Oh, no, I'm going to say one more point. One more point is we don't want to learn just one way to pour. You might say, oh, pouring, cool. I'm going to learn a really good way to pour. Um, I'm, I'm awesome. I, if I can pour like this, it's good. I'm perfect. I pour reliably every single time. I just, this is what I need to do. If you learn just that one way to pour, you are completely at a loss if for some reason you can't do it that way, right? So imagine that the thing that you have to pour from today is like really big, or uh, you're a waiter, a wine waiter in a fancy restaurant, and now your manager tells you you have to do the, like the backhanded fancy wine waiter pour, or your right arm is broken and you have to pour with your left arm or something. So you'd like to know the whole space of like reliable ways to pour, and that lets you be a much more robust person. Okay. I'm going to show you a movie. This is a fun movie. So here's Robot. It already knew how to pick things up and put them down, but we did this learning strategy for pouring and for pushing. And so here we can put the objects on the table basically how we want to, and we can give the robot different goals. So we gave it the goal of putting stuff in the little white bowl that time. This time, I think the goal is to, oh, to serve the stuff on the tray. Uh, here, it's moving the green box out of the way so it can get a good grasp of the cup that it has to pour from. It's coming over here to pour some stuff into the bowl. Um, I will show you one, uh, no, one more example after this one. So here, we told it to put the, to at the end, have stuff in the white bowl and the white bowl on the thing. Um, in this next example, um, it pushes the red bowl over in front of it so that it can pour into it. We never told it that that was a thing to do, uh, but it reasons that it, it, it's going to pour with one hand, and with that one hand, it can't reach all the way over where the bowl was. So it just knew that it had to get the bowl into a place that it could pour from, and it figured out how to do that. I think at this point, I am going to stop and answer a couple questions, and that will be time. So questions. Great. Uh, we have one from Jim Batista. A provoking question, since you asked for one, mm -hmm. <laughs> Sutton talks about the bitter lesson. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I.e. that methods that don't scale with data and compute eventually succumb to those that do, despite being better in the short term, hence the bitterness. What do you think about it? Yeah, awesome. So, so Rich was on my thesis committee, and I argue with him all the time. Um, and in fact, I wrote an answer to him that's on Medium. Uh, if you want to try to find it. Uh, so I think in some way he's right and in some way he's wrong. Um, it, is, it is absolutely true that anything we build into a system will be wrong. Uh, and it will introduce bias. In machine learning, not when we're thinking about bias and fairness, but if we're thinking about bias in the bias variance sense, we think about bias, Bias has two properties. One is that it keeps you from arriving at certain answers, but the other one is that it makes you learning much more efficient. And I think that in order to make progress in any reasonable time frame, I need to build some stuff in. Um, I think it's kind of, it's rationally possible to imagine not building in anything but even Rich doesn't want to do that, right? So I had to fight with him, actually. I said, you were building stuff in even now. He said, no, I'm not. I said, you absolutely are. Are you using ConvNets? And he said, yes. But as soon as you're using ConvNets, you're building something in. So it's, it's a matter of degree. And it's a matter of deciding what are the general things, the beautiful general things like convolution that we can build in and not do too much damage to the psyche of our robots. So I agree and I disagree. Thanks. Uh, the next one from Kwaja. Uh, approaching the problem of learning, if we consider the fact that a robot sees an onion, then it needs to figure out that it needs a knife, then to think that it needs an, 
a knife, uh, it needs to know that it needs to cut the onion. Then why it needs to cut the onion would require it to need to know that it wants to make curry. Why it needs to make curry, it needs to feed people, and it goes on. Uh, so the thing is very, is every problem that we as humans face in the world has a hierarchical recursive structure, which basically is an indirect form of inference is planning at every level, uh, which relates one part in the hierarchy to other levels of hierarchy. So even resolving it on the engineering front that you need uh, ensemble densities, which form new ensemble densities as the hierarchy goes. But what is needed is the principle that defines the growth and direction of that hierarchy. Uh, so isn't it largely a science and philosophical problem of finding those first principles that govern our need for survival and desire to live? Woo, okay. Um, you guys are good at coming up with long and complicated questions. Let's see, there's so much packed into that question. I will answer some projection of it. Um, I mean, so, there's reasoning from first principles. So I skipped this giant thing about models and that there was this quote about all models are wrong, but some are useful. So I think what an intelligent agent has to do is build models that are good enough, right? So cooking is, a, is an example I like to think about a lot because on the one hand, I feel like I can have a, this robot has a somewhat general model of just a, a space and occlusion and moving things out of the way. And so you can give it uh, rearrange the objects and it'll do kind of something reasonable. Uh, and the more that you have a good theoretical causal model of the domain, the more robust you can be and the more you can deal with things that go uh, not as planned. Cooking is an interesting domain because I think most people have like a partial causal model. So we all know that things will burn if you cook them too hot and a bunch of stuff like that. But we don't have perfect models of the applied chemistry that you would really need to infer exactly what will happen if you do something in the kitchen. And the reason we sometimes follow recipes is because, uh, because we don't have the causal model that we need and we just do the steps because somebody told us these steps were gonna work and we try to do it that way. So I think we need, we, we need models of all different kinds, different fidelities, different levels of abstraction and we have to figure out how to kind of deploy them all together in some way. Great, thanks. Uh, the next one from Anonymous, uh, could this, uh, or could these abilities you are trying to build into robots be the analogs to executive functions in humans? For example, cognitive flexibility is well represented on the goal changing in the airport uh, story when you didn't find your phone as expected. I think so. I don't know anything about humans. Uh, I have only folk psychology, not real psychology. But so, so I, can't, I can't say anything about how any of these mechanisms relate to humans. I'm sorry. Sounds good. Next one's from Ella. Have you repeated this experiment to see if the robot makes the same error, i.e. taking the chair out with it as it goes outside the room? <laughs> okay, good. Good, good, good. I love that question. And I'm going to give a little speech because it's a thing that I think is really important. Um, I actually had a couple of military ethicists come to my office a couple of years ago and they wanted, they were interested in autonomous weapons. They were smart people who had studied a lot about ethics and philosophy and all these things. And their first question to me was, has your robot ever done something you didn't expect? And I just like burst out laughing because the question is, does it ever do anything I do expect? Uh, and the answer is roughly no. So no, of course, if I repeated that experiment with the robot and the chairs and the door, it would do something really different every single time. We were like, we were aghast when it went out the door with the chair in his hand. We did not expect that. Um, but I think it's important, what's interesting and important actually now from a kind of a pragmatic and, and moral view in a way is to understand the way we program robots, right? So we no longer program robots in the way that kids learn to program robots in Lego Mindstorms where you say, move forward one meter, look, turn left, take a picture, move, whatever. We don't give a sequence of instructions that say, do this followed by this. If that's what we did, then it would be, uh, it would be surprising if the robot did something we didn't expect. Instead, we have a combination of machine learning and planning. These, uh, they're basically optimization algorithms that search a big space of possible answers and try to find one that's good. And the searching is non-deterministic. 
the, the, the particular sequence of images and the timing that they arrive, that's all non-deterministic. So, so, so no, we have no actual idea what's going to happen. Thanks. Next one's from Lou. Uh, why did the robot push the bow instead of taking the bow to a proper place? How did the robot evaluate among the actions? Good. So what it, um, it doesn't think it can pick up that bowl. I think that that red bowl is too, bus too big. Uh, and it didn't learn that. I think we probably coded that in there. So that's why it pushed it rather than picking it up. So it asks itself, it says, how can I move something? Okay, so how did that reasoning go? Let's just, let me work it backward for you. The high level objective was to have stuff in the red bowl. Uh, it's, it, it, and it says, well, what are the things that I could do to cause stuff to be in some container that it's not in? And it looks in its list of things it knows how to do and it says, oh, I have this general ability to pour. And that is an ability that will cause stuff to be in a new vessel. So I think I have to do pouring. So it kind of figures out that the last step it's going to need to do is pour. Then it uses that learning that I glossed by very quickly, the learned thing that said, well, if you're going to pour, it needs to be that you're holding the thing that's that got the stuff in it and you're holding it in a position, a relative position to the other thing that is suitable so that the pouring is going to work out. So it said, okay, well, that must mean I need to be holding a blue cup and I need the blue cup to be somewhere relative to the red bowl that satisfies this constraint. And then it, it, it said, it, you know, it probably thought about, well, could I do that by just with the red bowl where it is? And it figured out that it couldn't do it where the red bowl is where it is because of its kinematics. It couldn't reach all the way over there. So it said, well, how can I get two objects to be in some relation to each other when one is, you know, and then it, it realized that by moving the red ball into a, a, a more accessible place, it could, it could do this. So it does a kind of backward reasoning. Yeah. Great. Uh, we have time for one or two more. Uh, the next one from Laha is how to generate the sub goals and sub rewards according to a general goal and observation. Right. So there aren't rewards really in this system. So uh, the, I mean, the way that we view it is that there's some high level objective and there are costs associated with the steps, right? So you could say that those are like negative rewards. Um, so the way we think about making the hierarchy is that we have planning operations that have preconditions. We say, well, if these things were true and I did this operation, then it would have this result. And the way that we make a hierarchy is by postponing thinking about some of those preconditions. So we might say, for instance, I, and, and the, the principle for postponing preconditions is to postpone the ones that are easy to fix up locally. Like if you were planning to drive across the country, you might say, oh, well, I know that I'm gonna have to have gas, but I also know that I can probably arrange to get gas when I need it. So I'm gonna ignore that when I plan at the high level of abstraction. Or like, I might need to have my arm in a certain location to actually do that final pouring, but I know that it's pretty easy to move my arm around when I need to. That's easier than like acquiring the cup in the first place. So when I do my high level planning, I'll ignore exactly where my arm is for a while. So that's the kind of the idea. Thanks. Uh, next one from Kwan. Uh, how does the robot decide what to learn and what not to learn? Ah, good. Right now, I decide what to learn and what not to learn. And so that's completely unsatisfying. Almost no one, I think, has like a nice integrated architectural view of how you integrate learning and reasoning in a system that has an ongoing interaction with the world. And that's something that we're actively working toward. But right now, I don't really know how to do it. Great. Next one is from Quan as well. Uh, to what level are you using cognitive science or maybe neuroscience to install abstractions and learning algorithms? Not really at all. Um, I, the, the, the things that I take inspiration from are this, like the, the idea that it's sensible to build in an abstraction of the world in terms of objects and properties and relations, that it's sensible to build in some 3D structural understanding of space. 
Um, but no, I don't, I, I unfortunately don't really take any direct advantage right now of particular neuroscience or really cognitive results. Thanks. I think we can sneak one more in uh, from Judith. Uh, could the robot learn something by itself, i.e. by reasoning that it has to learn that thing in order to achieve a certain goal? For example, if the goal was to have stuff in the red bowl, but there is only stuff in the blue bowl, so the robot reasons that it needs to learn pouring? Ah, awesome. No, I wish. I mean, I, I like I'm burning to do that. I think I know kind of how to get that set up, but right now it cannot do that. Leslie, that was a totally wonderful lecture. Thank you so much for doing it. So, All right. Thank you for the good questions and have a good yeah, the rest yeah, of your summer school. Yeah, that's true.